Let's explore sexual reproduction in flowering plants. And to begin with, let's start by looking at the reproductive parts. So the two main reproductive parts are the male part, which is called the stamen, and the female part, which is called the carpel or the pistil. Now one way I remember the stamen is the male reproductive part because there's the word men in it. And that kind of helps me remember it. And when it comes to female, you might be wondering what's, is it the same thing, carpel and pistil? It's not really. And the difference can be seen when we have multiple carpels. So some flowers have more than one carpels, like what you see over here, but they are fused together. In this case, we will say it has three carpels, but there is only one pistil because they're fused to form one pistil. So you can think of pistil as a team of carpel. Here I have one team of three carpels, but it's also possible for us to have the three carpels which are separate, which are not fused together. In this case, we will say three carpel, three pistil. So because we have three different teams, but we don't have to worry too much about it because we'll not deal with such complicated flowers. Anyways, if we further look at the male parts, the male part stamen has actually two subparts. You have the long filament, and then on top of the filament contains the anther. And you can see small dots that are put over there. That's the pollen grains. That contains the male germ cell, the sperm cells. And similarly, the female part also has subparts. The carpel also has subparts. The top part, which is very sticky, which is where the pollen grain is supposed to sit, that's called the stigma. Then there is this long style. And then finally, we have the ovary. The ovary contains the egg cells. You can see tiny, tiny, do, tiny, tiny structures over here. That's where the egg cells sit. And for sexual reproduction, somehow the sperm cells inside the pollen grain is supposed to come and reach the egg cells inside the ovary. And we'll see how that happens soon. But before we do that, you may be wondering, can flowers have both the male and the female parts together? Well, some flowers do, others don't. There are some flowers, like for example, the flower of lily, which has both the male which parts, which you can see over here, you can see the stamen, and you can see the nice yellow anther, and it contains the carpels. You can see the carpel over here, it's a little hard to see. It contains both. Such flowers are called bisexual flowers. And most f f usual flowers that you think of, like rose, lilies, sunflowers, they're all bisexual flowers. On the other hand, if you look at the flowers of a papaya tree, what you see over here is only the carpels. You can only see the carpels over here. In fact, if you look closely, you can see two carpel fused together. So one pistil, two carpel, another pistil, two carpel, but again, don't worry about it. So you only see female parts over here. But on another papaya flower, you can see only, again, you can see the nice yellow male anthers. So this is the male flower. So these are the flowers that only contain a female or male parts. So these are unisexual flowers. And when it comes to unisexual, think big fruits and big vegetables like watermelon, pumpkin, papaya. These are all usually having unisexual flowers. Now let's come back to our question. How does a sperm cell inside these pollen grains reach the egg cells inside the ovary? Well, for that, there needs to be pollination. Pollination is where the pollen grains go and sit on top of the stigma. And there are a few ways in which that can happen. So for example, one way that can happen is when the pollen grains from one flower sits on the stigma of that very same flower. That's one possibility. Another possibility is the pollen grains from one flower goes and sticks to the stigma of another flower, but of the same plant or of the same tree. And the third possibility is that you can have the pollen grains from one flower goes and sits on the stigma of a different flower from a different tree altogether or a different plant altogether. So all these are pollinations, but the first two is called self-pollination. Why self? Because it is happening within the same plant, within the same flower or within the two different flowers of the same tree, whatever it is, same plant. And in the third case, because it's happening between two different plants or two different trees, we will call this cross-pollination. Now, of course, cross does not mean across species. No, 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 same species, obviously. A lily flower has to pollinate with another lily flower only, 
The cross means it's across two different plants or two different trees. But how does it, how does the pollination happen? Well, it usually happens via wind or it can happen by insects. Insects love to sit and suck the nectar from the flower, right? So that time the pollen grains can get stuck to them. And when they go and sit on a different flower, it's possible that the pollen grains get stuck to the stigma. But what happens next? For that, let's zoom in. We have the pollen grain sitting on the stigma, that's pollination. And we have the sperm cells inside the pollen grain and we have the egg cells inside the ovary over here. How does this reach over here? Well, for that, the pollen grain germinates and there's a tube that comes. And that tube eventually finds its way towards the egg cells. And then inside the tube, the sperm cells travel. They travel, 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 travel all the way and then finally reach and meet the egg cells. And when that happens, we say fertilization has happened. The two cells unite to form a new cell and this new united new cell formed due to the you know due to the sperm cell and the egg cell uniting that new cell now is called the zygote the zygote keeps multiplying eventually it becomes a tiny baby plant which we call the embryo and the embryo eventually gets protected inside a seed and during this time, we'll find that the entire ovary swells up and that eventually becomes the part of the fruit. And that's why we usually find the seed to be inside these fruits. And then we animals eat the fruit and then the seed finds its way on the ground and when the conditions are right, the seed can start germinating and eventually this plant can grow and form its own flowers and the cycle repeats. Amazing, isn't it?